My name's Kenan Malik, uh, and it's a pleasure and an honour to uh, be both at this conference and um, in the debate this morning. We're going to be talking about religion and freedom of expression. Religion has clearly become a major source of confrontation for freedom of expression, both what you might call the hard type of censorship, places like Egypt and Turkey and, pa and uh, Pakistan, where criticising religion can lead, you, lead to prison, even death. And what you might call the soft censorship you find in Britain or America or Norway, where there's an unwillingness, a greater unwillingness to criticise religion, perhaps because it's felt not right, immoral, or, or perhaps because of fear. And we want to be discussing both those things uh, this morning. And to do so, we've got uh, three people who are intimately involved in the uh, debate about religion and free speech. Um, later, I'll be talking to Gupi Bhatti, he's an uh, award-winning British playwright, and uh, uh, Azar Usman, who's an uh, American comedian. But first, uh, to begin with her take on uh, religion uh, and uh, the quest of free expression, particularly in America, we've got uh, Svetlana Mincheva, who is the Director of Programs uh, at America's National Coalition Against Censorship and the founding director of its advocacy program, its arts advocacy program, the only US national initiative devoted to uh, art and free expression uh, at the moment. So can you please welcome Svetlana Mincheva? Thank you. Oops, <laughs> hello, I'm happy to be here, but it must be strange for you that a country that has the most expansive protections of free speech should also have an organization dedicated to protecting against censorship. And actually, not only one, we have a number of organizations uh, that deal with censorship. Um, and some people ask me, in, but in the US, like, what are you doing? We don't have any censorship here. This is, we have the First Amendment. But actually, I can assure you, we're not idle. Um, there, there is an often quoted um, a sentence saying, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And uh, so it is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, um, censorship in the US today does happen. It happens mostly on the local level, and uh, it rarely attains national, let alone international prominence. Um, but there are ongoing attempts to remove artwork from exhibition spaces, books from schools, and so on and so on. Um, but wh what is really key here is that censorship in, um, in the US and in the neoliberal West in general is much more subtle. It's, it's mutating. Censorship is a very uh, persistent uh, feature of human existence. And it doesn't go away. Um, but we don't have torture, we don't have arrests, we don't have bur book burnings. There is nothing um, so dramatic and, um, uh, and uh, powerful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have references to very vague yet very potent terms like uh, appropriateness, what is appropriate or inappropriate, what are community standards and community sensitivities. We shouldn't have something because we just, as a community, and whoever defines community is the question here, uh, our community does not want it. Uh, so these are what I call censorship disguises, those claims to appropriateness. Um, and it's, it's very nice that the, the censor wants to be disguised, that there's an admission that censorship is not good. Uh, but that doesn't make it um, less damaging. And um, the, the success of those disguises today um, is also a result of something uh, that is a very disturbing tendency, which is a diminishing commitment to free speech, even in the countries where free speech has a very, very long tradition. Uh, and, you know, when we're talking about religion, of course, we think about the recent controversy around the innocence of Muslims. And it might have seemed from outside of the U.S. that the U.S. was very firmly on the side of free speech and the First Amendment. Uh, however, inside the country, you could see uh, headlines like these. There, there was um, this renewed debate about 
whether free speech is indeed going too far, whether we overvalue free speech, whether there are a number of other interests that might be more important than protecting a crappy uh, video that is so deliberately offensive. Um, there were many voices claiming, well, this is not what free speech should be. This is um, incitement to violence, this is hate speech, this is uh, deliberate insult. Now, uh, but for incitement uh, to violence, which this video actually is not, uh, according to US law, hate speech and deliberate insults are protected in the United States. They, they're not protected in a lot of other Western countries. In the US, uh, they are protected. Uh, so this fact in itself brings a number of um, arguments that actually we should stop, we should narrow free speech protections. We should not have protection for, uh, for hate speech and for speech that is deliberately offensive to a particular um, group. And now, um, increasingly US culture is operating under an impression that there is a right not to be offended. Um, in legal circles, scholars are claiming, yes, we have to, we have to change the interpretation of the First Amendment. Uh, but more than that, there is a kind of averseness to anything offensive that permeates the culture from academia to the public art establishment. But then you can say, why not be sensitive to the feelings of others? Why not show some respect when you are um, exercising your right to free speech? Why deliberately offend somebody's very deeply felt sensitivities? Now, one of the reasons is that people are very quick to claim offense and to argue that something is hate speech when they just plain don't like it. And these are images from, uh, there are no riots in the US, they are protests and demonstrations and picketing of uh, various plays and uh, exhibitions that um, uh, some religious groups do not like. Um, and uh, if hate speech laws existed, these people will claim that they should be uh, brought into action against artwork like this. As it is, um, the big argument that works is the argument that money should not be spent to support such work, that taxpayer money, if I'm paying for something as a taxpayer, it should not offend me. And because there's a pretty large constituency of taxpayers, there's something that offends everyone. Uh, the picture to your right was um, one of the, it's a, it's a photograph, was uh, one of the tools used to attack federal funding for the arts in the 90s. Uh, it was brought up again and again uh, with the claim in Congress that um, if federal funding for the arts is used for such offensive work, which isn't on its face offensive, but the title is Piss Christ, so that makes it offensive. If federal money is spent on work like that, there should be no federal money for the arts at all. Uh, the image on your left was used by ex-New uh, York Mayor Giuliani to attack the Brooklyn Museum uh, for the Arts and try to evict it from its space. Um, and there are other um, examples of where work was in a public museum uh, and people said, well, you know, this public museum belongs to us, it gets taxpayer money, it should not be a space where uh, in the middle the Virgin of Guadalupe is shown as uh, what some Catholics interpreted a slut. Um, and in the image um, at the bottom, this is the artist nude as in a self-portrait of herself in the context of the Last Supper. Uh, that image became a reason for, again, uh, ex-New York Mayor Giuliani to ask for uh, the creation of a decency committee to oversee art in all museums in New York City that receive public funds. So when th this kind of debate comes up, on the other hand, there's a huge military budget in the US, as I'm sure you're aware. And, and nobody says, well, you know, as a taxpayer, I'm offended by the way this money is spent. And it is uh, astronomically higher than the budget for the arts. However, 
that uh, I don't get to vote and say, well, this budget offends me, stop funding for the military. But for some reason, the arts have become such a vulnerable target, especially in economically tight times, uh, that the, uh, the argument that art should be defunded if they're offensive is potent. Um, and of course, more uh, this is work that's more recent, again, claims to um, uh, remove funds have led to uh, the removal in, on the left, the work was removed because uh, the Smithsonian, a large U.S. institution, was threatened with losing its funding. Uh, the work on the right was in a public art space. It wasn't removed because of the First Amendment, but see, uh, see what happened to it. On, down on the right, a person came and vandalized it. So uh, there are attempts to censor by economic means, if they don't work, violence also happens in the United States. Um, on the, you saw the uh, work on your left two slides ago, this work, that's what happened to it. Somebody came in the museum and whitewashed it. Um, and uh, the work on the top is um, Andres Serrano, the one in the uh, two slides ago again, that was, that's a little cheating, that's in France, it was vandalized. So vandalism uh, and violence happens um, as well. Uh, but religious offense does not end with art that uses religious symbols. As you know, um, some religions, um, some trends of Christianity, especially Protestantism, have problems with the human body. And nudity in the U.S. is now probably tops censorship attempts. And uh, every time a nude appears in public, somebody is going to claim it is a scene inappropriate, bad for children, too sexual, and it has to be removed. So uh, that happens with some regularity. Currently, the image on your right, there's a religious organization called the American Family Association. They are claiming it's obscene and they want it removed from a park in Kansas. It was a gift from a Chinese artist. So th this is the kind of stuff that's considered obscene in the US uh, by private interest groups. Um, and that very attitude to the body expressed uh, when there is a demand to put clothes on a new sculpture comes from religion. And then it's disguised into a formula of general standards of decency. Uh, and whose standards of decency are those? They're, they're certainly not mine or of my friends, but uh, some groups are claiming these are the general standards. And that spreads to different parts of, of life, you know, issues about homosexuality, how we control uh, discourse about sexuality and homosexuality is um, very much uh, a battle that is inspired by um, uh, the beliefs of religious organizations. Those two books, In Our Mother's Houses uh, and The Family Book, were books that were part of the tolerance curriculum in, in some schools. They were removed because they went against some people's religious beliefs that homosexuality is bad. They want to not teach tolerance in schools. Um, so these books are currently removed from the curriculum. Um, so religious censorship is not only about protecting the faithful from offense, and probably not this at all, because those offensive images would not have been seen by the people protesting. They probably won't even go into the museum. It's a different constituency. Religious censorship insists on determining how we live, whom we marry, how we relate to our bodies. Uh, it's about imposing one system of values on society as a whole. And censorship, religious or otherwise inspired in a neoliberal democracy, is much more subtle and smart than the overt and ugly censorship that you heard about uh, in Burma and elsewhere. And it's uh, disguised under more noble forms, uh, from protecting children, from material that could be harmful for them, uh, respect and sensitivity for the values of others, all wonderfully sounding things, unless you look at them and how they function in practice. So, uh, and then it works behind the scenes by creating fear, fear of lost funding, fear of potential violence, fear of the nightmare, the public relations nightmare of controversy. And this fear then in turn leads to self-censorship which is not visible, but 
it works on this kind of insidious level to ultimately impoverish the public dialogue and even worse, hamper thought and the imagination itself. Thank you. Thanks, Svetlana. I mean, Svetlana will be joining us later for a, a broader discussion on, on some of these points and, and, and the question of religion and uh, free expression. But first, um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, the second guest, who's Gupreet Bhatti. She's an uh, award-winning British playwright, written extensively for uh, radio, for screen, uh, for the stage. And in 2004, her play, Besti, which explored the question of sexual abuse uh, within a Sikh community, was forced off stage in Birmingham uh, after violent protests by Sikh activists uh, who deemed it to be offensive to the Sikh community. So please welcome Gupreet Bhatti. <laughs> yes, you might as well sit there. Um, the, Gupreet, the... the issue at the heart of Bestie, as it is about many of the uh, confrontations with religion uh, and with, with culture, if you like. Um, it's about the community. What is a community? Who speaks for a community? What are, who draws the lines beyond which things may or may not be said? Now, you once said that if you have to be the itch in the community, so be it. What, what do you mean by being the itch in the community? Um, I think what I mean is that as an artist, I have impulses to talk about things, to explore things, to say things, and I have to be true to that impulse, um, whatever it is that I'm creating. And in my case, in my... In, in the work that I've created, um, some of that work has been around the community that I come from. Um, I'm a second-generation British Sikh woman. Um, my parents were first-generation. And I think that when the first generation of, of our community came to Britain, um, there was a real need to succeed, and it was very hard. You know, they experienced a lot of racism. And I think the community kind of really was protecting itself and uh, wanting to kind of look after itself. As things have evolved, um, I, I think, f for me, I just wanted to talk about issues that I saw within the community, any community, you know, um, and for me, it was the hypocrisy around faith and religion and the complexity of that. It wasn't about, you know, these people are, are, are good or bad. It was the pressure, actually, of being in a community and having to live up to um, expectations. Um, and I think what happened with Bejdi was that it was almost like one of our own <laughs> is kind of airing dirty laundry. Sure, and in a sense, that's the fate of um, uh, artists from minority communities, that, sure. that both those from within the community and those from outside the community, in a sense, see you as representing the community. Absolutely, and I'm a writer. You know, the fact that I'm you know, exploring something within a specific context is you know, just a choice. I mean, you know... It, 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 it could have been any religion, any thing, but I chose to make it very specific because I think creatively, if you choose to be very specific, you can then speak a universal language. Um, and I think, you know, a community is not a homogenous thing, you know. Um, it, it, there are lots of Sikhs who supported me, who supported the play. Um, and I think Certainly what's happened in Britain is that you have, you know, sometimes sort of self-appointed community leaders. And the issue with Bejdi was, was actually not that there were, you know, protests and death threats, etc., etc. It was the fact that the theatre chose to pull the play. 
And I think it's about how the institutions respond to the, 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 the needs and the demands sure. of those community leaders. I want, I want to come back to that in a minute, which, okay. which, is, which is how those from outside the community, as it were, sees what, see what the needs of a particular community are. But just this, this question about... Um, uh, you, you were saying the Sikh community, like any community, is, is not homogenous. Yeah. And yet, part of the perception, a kind of major perception driving much of arts policy, much of the argument about censorship, is that a country like Britain is diverse, but somehow that diversity magically stops at the edges of minority communities. And we come yeah. to think about minority communities as being homogenous, speaking with a single voice, yeah. having a single view on these kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me it's, it's that sense of diversity, but only outside minority communities, that, that lies at the heart of the problem. Yeah. No, totally, I agree. How do, I mean, one of the arguments in relation to um, that, that's, that's risen in, in recent years is that because we live in a plural society, so we need less free speech, that for a plural society to function and to be fair, mm. we need to be careful what we say to each other, mm. um, uh, not to uh, create conflicts and frictions. Mm. How, how do you respond to that? I think, I think we need uh, much more <laughs> conversation. I think we need to be less careful. I think we need to um, shout and scream at each other if necessary, because I think otherwise you get a kind of placid, bland, banal interaction, and you never really know somebody, you know, you only know the outside, you're not really getting to, you know, the inside of what somebody's saying, because ultimately that, um, you know, that kind of negotiating in that way is fear-based. It's because part of me is a bit scared of who you really might be, and I think it's harder, actually, to be, to be truthful and say, you know, I find this difficult about you, I don't understand, I don't know, you know, explain to me, tell me, rather than, you know, and I, I think, you know, you have in, in culture the whole sort of food, flags and festivals, the whole, you know, that's the kind of perception of, like, you know, an Asian community, but I mean, not, not from everybody, but, you know, it, 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 I, I think I've always just wanted to scratch the surface. And probably like most artists, you know, to look underneath, to, you know, go where is, you know, harder or frightening, because that's just where my impulses take me and what I'm interested in. And ultimately, as a human being, I have to be true to that. Well... We'll come back to some of these issues uh, a bit later on because we're going to have a, a, a broader discussion on this. But first, let me introduce uh, Azar Usman, who's an a American uh, comedian. Um, his play, uh, or his, his show, um, uh, Allah Made Me Funny, uh, the official Muslim community tour, comedy tour, uh, my apologies, um, has toured in over 20 countries. And you can ha I think the title itself gives you a flavour of... Uh, what it may be like. Uh, Asa. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Give it up for yourselves for coming out. I think everybody needs to loosen up. Uh, it's been a really tight morning. <laughs> it's very depressing stories. This guy's a comedian, he was in jail. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> you guys doing all right? It's nice to be here. Maybe I should speak my British accent. People always have a hard time understanding me in Europe. I speak with my American accent. That's right, when I come to Europe, it's very confusing because I'm American and Muslim. So over here, you guys don't know if you should hate me or hate me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's great to be here, man. I've been traveling like crazy. I love being a comedian. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. My least favorite thing is all the travel. Uh, not just because I'm exhausted all the time and I miss my kids. It also means I have to go to the airport. You could laugh right there, man. It's, you could write your own joke. I get a lot of dirty looks when I walk at the airport, so I start to play, I start messing around, people start making dirty looks back like. <clears throat> <clears throat> Somebody's like, hey, you got a problem? I'd be like, yes, I do. 
My stomach hurts. <laughs> Tacos. Chipotle. <laughs> Do you guys have Chipotle yet? Chipotle. It's gonna, it's gonna come, trust me, because McDonald's owns it. It's a true story. <laughs> you can Google that. Google is amazing, am I right? It's, it completely changed our lives. How can any discussion about freedom of expression be free of Google, which has radically altered our lives forever, right? You have the entire world in your pocket, which is amazing. My favorite thing about Google, such a simple, elegant website, right? White background, Google, one search box, two buttons. One says Google search. The other one says I'm feeling lucky. I'm not so sure why that button's feeling so lucky since nobody clicks on it. I wanted to find out what I'm feeling lucky does, so I Googled it. Here's the crazy thing. I accidentally hit I'm feeling lucky, took me back to the Google homepage. What? That joke is infinite. Uh, it's great to be here, though, man. And the thing is, it is true. I walk down the street. Uh, I do get a lot of dirty looks. But I also get a lot of curious looks because people have a lot of questions and they never have an opportunity to ask those questions in a safe environment. Sometimes they just shout them out randomly in the street. This is a true story. I was walking on the sidewalk. This guy was across the street. He's like, is it real? Is it real? I'm like, is what real? Is existence real? I'm not a solipsist. Yes. No, is it real? I was like, oh no, it's a clip-on. I just wear it on the weekends. I got somebody laughing right there. <laughs> Your laugh is banned and therefore desired. <laughs> and I, I got a, little, a lot of weird questions. This is one of my personal favorites, right? A lot of women will do this to me like, can I touch it? Like, excuse me, can I touch it? If you really want to, you can go for it, but I'm gonna warn you right now, basically feels like pubic hair. I'm sorry, <laughs> disgusting yet accurate. So you can go for it if you really want, but that's a decision you will instantaneously regret. <laughs> the, other, the other personal favorite, I get this all the time, people, what does it feel like, man? What is it, you're rocking a big beard in civilization? What does it feel like? I will tell you what it feels like. Mean people look at me and wonder if I might be a terrorist. And nice people look at me and wonder if I play cricket for South Africa. <laughs> you gotta know about cricket for that joke. <laughs> you can Google it if you're feeling lucky. I've been traveling like crazy. I've actually been very blessed in my life to do stand-up all over the planet. I mean, literally like on five continents and I'm very blessed and I'm very fortunate and I'm very grateful, but I'd like to share something that I learned while I was traveling the world. You guys wanna hear it? That's weak. You guys wanna hear it? Check this out. This is exactly how I feel. I'm, I'm being dead honest, man. I made people laugh all over the planet, different colors, different religions, different races, different sizes, shapes, colors, sexual orientation, gender, age, language. And I'm here to tell you this morning in Oslo, Norway, we're all exactly the same. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't mean that it's all like lame bumper sticker. Let me tell you what I mean. You are a bird in a cage. You were a bird before your cage, you're a bird inside your cage, and you'll be a bird after the cage, but never forget, you are the bird, you are not the cage. Half the audience like, what the fuck, what just happened? <laughs> you are a penguin floating in space, eating chocolate brownies, watching television. What is he talking about? Modern art. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I didn't, mean the second, I didn't mean the second part, I meant the first part. You're a bird in a cage, you were a bird before your cage, you're a bird inside your cage, you'll be a bird after your cage, but never forget, you are the bird, you are not the cage. The mistake we all make is thinking that the cage is the real you. I'll give you a story to illustrate this point. I was flying home to Chicago from London Heathrow Airport. I did that thing that we all do when I got to the gate, you know, start assessing the situation. That's, those people have kids, stay away from me. That guy is sneezing, bad news. Across the gate, I saw this dude, I'm not gonna lie, he happened to be a white guy, real clean cut in a very expensive suit with a briefcase, just giving me dirty looks. You know you can say fuck you with your eyes, just I was like, oh yeah? 
We started having a little energy war at the gate. And something in my heart, I was like, man, I don't like this guy. This guy's a douchebag. Then they called boarding for first class. He got up. I was like, I knew it, douchebag. He goes on the plane. 10 minutes later, they called boarding for the poor people. I got in line. I'm looking at my boarding pass. I'm in 7C, okay, 7C. I know I gotta pass by this guy because I gotta go through the first class cabin. I'm not happy about that. I get on the plane, I saw him right away. He was in 3D, left side, third row, aisle aisle C, just giving me dirty. I was like, I went and sat down. And something in my heart, I was like, I don't like this guy. This guy is a jerk. This guy is a douchebag. I'm gonna keep an eye on this guy. Which is weird that I was keeping an eye on a guy in first class in a plane. I didn't realize how ridiculous I was at the time. Just as how it went down. So the plane took off somewhere about 45 minutes into the flight. We're in the clouds. I was looking at this dude. This guy was all up in my energy. I was like, I don't like this dude. I started putzing around with that phone. You guys know about the phone on the back of the seat, right? This phone that's never been used in the history of aviation. I think they have them on the back of these seats for some reason too, I don't know why. I started putzing around with that phone. They have like video games and stuff. That is when I discovered a little known feature on the plane phone. Anybody? Venture a guess? What is it? Come on, go ahead. I heard it. Somebody said. Correct answer. You can call other seats. Let the games begin! 3D, send. It started rigging right away. I got so excited. And I saw his head pop up over the seat like. Which is exactly the right answer and the right response when your phone rings on a plane. For no reason whatsoever. No explanation, no warning. It took like 10, 15 rings for him to figure out what's going on. And then finally I hear all this fumbling like, hello, hello. It's the first time I heard his voice. I was like, British, I knew it, douchebag. <laughs> Apologies to the Brits. <laughs> He's like, hello, hello, and then I hung up. Because that's the first thing you do when you prank call somebody. You got to make sure the system works. You got to regroup. You got to commit to this prank. You hear a little angel voice in your heart like, don't do it, don't do it, devil, do it, do it. 3D, send, brr, brr. Hello, hello. And then I went, hello. I made a scary face and nobody could see me. He's like, hello, who is this? Who is this? And I went, you're gonna die. And I hung up. I don't even know why I said that shit. But immediately I had three sensations. First of all, I was like, this is awesome. (laughs) Second of all, I was like, I am a horrible human being. Third of all, I was like, I can't get arrested. What the hell am I doing? This is a terrible decision. I put, trust me, I put myself in some very compromising situations. I've never been this close to going to Guantanamo Bay <laughs> due to my childishness and immaturity. Started freaking out. I'm like, what happens now? What if he's legitimately scared? And he's like, bing, excuse me, ma'am. Someone just rang my phone and informed me I was going to die. Perhaps I could get to that. She's going to tell the pilot, next thing you know, the pilot diverts the plane. I'm getting arrested, international news on CNN and BBC. I'm a comedian, I swear to God, I was just joking. (laughs) Sort of freaking out, man. Now, what you don't know about me, Oslo, Norway, before I became a comedian, I used to be an attorney. Surprise! (laughs) Adjust your cognitive frames. So as a result... As a result, the lawyer in me kicks in. I started going through all the facts. Like, what did I say? What did I not say? What did I do? What did I not do? What did he say? What did he not say? What did he do? What did he not do? What potential legal exposure and liability do I have in under these facts? And that's when it hit me. I got an airtight defense. Started getting cocky. I was like, you know what? I hope they arrest me. I hope they land this plane in Chicago. They got the Chicago Police Department, FBI, TSA, NSA, drag me off the plane, take me in a corner, put me in a room, light in my face. But did you make a phone call on the plane? I'd be like, yes, I did. <laughs> did you call the gentleman in seat 3D? I'd be like, yes, I did. <laughs> did you tell him he's going to die? I'd be like, yes, I did. Why did you say that? Because it's true. <laughs> he is going to die. One day, I didn't stipulate a time frame. I just made a general observation. 
He's going to die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody's going to die. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a good Samaritan. I saw a guy getting on a plane. He looked like he was in doubt about his own mortality. I just thought I'd send a friendly reminder. Hey, buddy, don't forget. Party's going to end one day. You're going to die. Airtight defense. Case dismissed. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the laughs. Thank you, I said. I think I'll have to use you as an attorney next time I'm in trouble. <laughs> and I might be against plagiarism, but I'm going to steal that burden of cage metaphor. It's wonderful. Um, um, Svetlana and Azza are going to join us now for a, for a broader discussion on the, on the question of religion and free speech. I mean, we can all agree, we can all accept, um, I think there are very few people who wouldn't accept that religion has become a major source of of, of confrontation of problems uh, for free speech um, and not just in the arts. But there's a big debate as to why that should be so. Um, you know, for some, religion itself is the problem, that there's something about religion uh, that, that creates those confrontations. For, for, for others, um, they see it as, as a more, as more political, these are political confrontations that are, take the form of, of uh, uh, religious ones. Maybe I should start with, with you. So, I mean, how, where do you stand on that? Yeah, I think that question is a, is a complicated one because what politics means to some people, it doesn't mean to others. What religion means to some people, it doesn't mean to others. So the problem becomes a very uh, definitional problem and a philosophical problem. I personally subscribe to the view that you know, religion in the modern world um, has become framed as if it's confrontational to modernity and to modernism. And there's probably some truth to that, because if you take a philosophical understanding of the fact that every human society, every human age, throughout all of human civilization, has had certain philosophical underpinnings that inform the age, then it's, it goes without saying that religion offers an epistemology, a way of looking at reality and viewing the world, and modernism, a competing philosophical, offers a competing epistemology. And when those epistemologies come into conflict is when, in the political realm and in, in the realm of you know, the tensions between religion and free expression and free speech kind of play out on the drama and on the world stage. But underneath it is people's deeply held convictions about this is the true nature of reality and this is the correct way to understand reality. Yeah, though you could say, I mean, if you take something like the innocence of Muslims, yeah. um, uh, kind of worldwide uh, confrontation, worldwide violence about, uh, over it. But if you take the number of Muslims in the world, and look at the number of people who actually took to the streets in protest. Even somewhere like Libya or Egypt, if you take the proportion, you know, if you take the number of Muslims in Egypt and the number of Muslims in, 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 in Libya, uh, and, and look at the number of people who took, uh, who took to the streets who protested, the vast majority would not have protested. Um, and, but because you don't think of them as, because they, precisely because they don't protest, they don't make the news, they're, they're not on CNN or BBC. So there's, there's a problem, perhaps, in the way we think about what religion is and how it is confrontational with respect to uh, free speech. So, Lana? Well, I, uh, you know, definitionally, I think, you know, politics, if we think of politics as not so much party politics, but as a struggle for power and to, a struggle to define how we live, I think religion is clearly, and I'll give you some example, used as a political tool. It's, it's used because it engages people's deeply felt uh, convictions, and it's easy to start manipulating people using that. But look at recent, look at Pussy Riot. And look what's going on, what's going on there. It's, it's a, sort of about religion and offense to religion. It's actually about government. It's, it's, uh, the problem there is that they're criticizing Putin, so there is this kind of like combination of government uh, and, and religious orthodoxy that um, it are impossible to disentangle, but by saying these um, uh, girls are so offensive to our religious feelings, then you um, uh, mobilize the Putin supporters. In, in the United States, um, the 90s culture wars, these were um, wars that were pretty much um, uh, people on the right wanted to limit funding for the arts because we should only fund the military, not the arts and education. What was used were certain images that were 
um, were said to be offensive to, uh, to religion. These were also like speaking about the insider group and outsider groups. The people producing those images were all, all came from a Catholic background and Catholics are the ones that objected to that. So it was, well, these Catholics are using, um, these artists are using their heritage to, in, in a way that contradicts church dogma, but they were used politically. So I, I, I think kind of, uh, and you can look at the innocence of Muslims and, and what happened in, in Egypt, and, and there was a lot of uh, internal political uh, contestation between Salafists and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, on the one hand, and then kind of the general mobilization of anti-American emotions. So every time you look at an art conflict that involves religion, it also involves a very clear <coughs> political sides, and religion is used to mobilize emotion and, and make this uh, a really deeply felt conflict. And that's interesting because you know, we often talk about an offense to a community, um, as if certain things like whether it's the satanic verses or uh, uh, Vesti or, or, or um, the innocent of Muslims offended a community. Whereas often we're talking about actually a debate within that community where one side in that community decides or and are seen as representing that community and therefore it's seen as an offence to that community. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, people hijack religion you know, for their own purposes. Um, for control, for repression, for, suppre for suppression. I mean, in, in my case, it's a, it's a long time ago, but all the objections were, you know, use of religious phrases or symbolism or, you know, it was all the kind of external things. And, you know, I'm a Sikh. I believe in God. I'm not a, an atheist. And I just kind of felt, you know, is your faith so weak? You know, who cares what I say or what I think or what I've written in my play, you know? Have your faith. And I remember, a, I'll just finish on this, a conversation I had. There was a massive demonstration going on outside the theatre. And one of the older guys who was one of the protesters came up to me and he said, you know, when I see your name, you know, Gurpreet Gaur Bhatti, which is a very Sikh name, you know, I, I, I feel so proud, I see your name, and, you know, you've written this play, but why do you, you know, why do you have to set it in a Gurdwara? And I said, you know, as, as strongly as, as you feel you have to come and protest, that's how, as strongly as I feel, that I have to set my play in this place. And I said, you feel that, I feel this. Is that not okay? You know, is, is that not all right? And I think it's that trying to work towards that acceptance of difference within a community. But I think it's, it's very fear-based. You know, people want to protect themselves and protect the things that they think will give them control over others. And that, that's kind of... Uh, perceptions within, within a community, but it's also the perceptions of that community from the outside. So, from, from, from those who, who are outside the Sikh community, do not see you as Sikh. They, they see Sikh protesters as representing the Sikh community. They see the protesters against, they don't see Salman Rushdie as having actually a debate within the Muslim community uh, about, uh, and, and that, say, the satanic verses was part and parcel of a debate that's been going on for a long time. But they only see protesters against the satanic verses as being truly Muslim. And, and there's, there's this kind of perception that's risen over what is authentically religious. To be authentically religious, you have to, you have to oppose the satanic verses or vesti. And if you don't, you're somehow too westernised or too secular to be authentically of that community. Yeah, uh, um, this is a tension, I think, that everybody can appreciate at some level because we're all forced to kind of experience it. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, religion has been, as Gurpreet said, kind of hijacked. Um, one of my favorite bumper stickers said, Dear God, save me from your followers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that's a really profound, you know, kind of joke summation of the issue. But I would like to share one thought. You know, Molana Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, who's a big inspiration to me, uh, he has this great um, little vignette in, in the Masnavi and he says 
you know, people who doubt the existence of God, he's critiquing atheism, but he says those who doubt the existence of God are like a school of fish assembled in the middle of the ocean who have gathered together to discuss the possibility of the existence of the ocean. <laughs> but, the, the, but the story, the, the, the vignette is, is powerful because it has to do with cognitive frames. You know, sometimes we're too close to our own lenses to be able to see that those lenses are informing the way we are viewing reality and they're so pervasive that they become invisible. I think that we're living in a time of visual media and visual medium and a 24 hour news cycle, etc. Whereby, you know, the, to your point, uh, Kenan, that that you know, we're we're just we see what's on television, we see what's on the internet, we see what's in film, and those images are so deeply impactful that we necessarily, you know, they force us to reach conclusions which may not comport with reality. I mean, it's not the case that that uh, Gurpreet is not as much Sikh as anybody else, but in the view in the mind of the of the average non-Sikh, because we're so used to seeing a particular image, mm. or in, in my case, people will see. And that's the interesting thing about growing a beard now. For me, suddenly I get associated with a whole range of <laughs> cognitive frames for people without them even knowing that they've adopted those unconsciously. But isn't it more than simply um, those visual images? It is a, a kind of sense that there is certain things that are authentically of, uh, of cultures, particularly minority cultures. This never applies to majority cultures. You don't talk about what is authentically white or authentically British or authentically American. But you talk, do talk about what is authentically Muslim yeah. or authentically Sikh. Um, and so, it, in a sense, it's more than simply those visual metaphors. It, it is the way we've come to understand what minority cultures are and how they should be represented in the public sphere. Svetlana? Well, there's, I, I think the, these are sort of performatives, those concepts of, of community, of, of religion, of authenticity. It, it, they don't reflect the... I mean, reality is raw. It doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't kind of like come through in discourse directly. So you shape it. And there are sort of these kind of shaping fictions and um, community is one of them, especially relating to censorship. What, what is community? And uh, you know, I mentioned community standards, and that's become community values, community sensitivities has become in the U.S. one of the major reasons to, to censor and to self-censor. Uh, art spaces say, well, you know, we're removing this because it's not appropriate to our community. We have certain sensitivities. We, we have a kind of... Uh, we're living in a world that's extremely diverse. We have um, uh, people living next to each other that come from various religious traditions, yet this notion of community is becoming stronger. And um, wh why is this? It, it's not like it's reflecting a homogenous community. And I don't even know that in the 50s, where our fiction of a, a homogenous community, we sort of remember that's when it existed, and now it's, it's more diverse. But we are, I, I think, in a way, uh, as a result, as a reaction to the kind of instability uh, brought about demographic changes that people next door to you don't think like you, uh, then the fiction of community is becoming more powerful. You, you are nostalgic for something, uh, for this kind of um, homogeneity for people that believe like you. So you want to impose it on the world. And you, uh, you want to press your idea of what community standard should be on everyone else. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of aggressive political fiction. And um, it's, it's very problematic because it brings uh, this, well, maybe these are the community standards and I should stand back as an art institution and not show something that offends them. It is a political fiction, but I suppose what I'm trying to tease out is whether uh, it's, it's, a, it's not simply believed from within the community. It, it, on, it only has purchase because cultural institutions, political institutions more broadly, buy into that fiction and, and, and want to talk about a community with a particular point of view and, uh, a, as you said, certain community leaders who, who represent them um, and, and refuse to see the diversity within those communities. Well, I was just going to add to what you were saying. I, mean, I, think, I think everything you're saying is absolutely the case. Uh, it is as much a reflection of disparity of power as it is you know, definitional a definitional problem for communities to define what is a community, who, what are the boundaries of that community, who's in, who's in the community, who's out of that community. But uh, you know, from a religious standpoint, just historically looking at religion, the tension between orthodoxy and heterodoxy 
is something that's always been part of religion. And uh, those who are kind of at the fringes are always the ones who kind of expand the boundaries of what is considered orthodoxy. And it, it takes time for that to happen. But uh, one thing that was occurring to me when you were talking about, and, and so Svetlana as well, is the fact that you know, for Muslims in America, the term Muslim has become a political category. And what's interesting to me about it is that the term is both under-inclusive and over-inclusive. Because it's under-inclusive because it doesn't even, people hear Muslim, they don't think of, for example, African Americans. Mm. Uh, black Muslims in America are the single largest racial demographic of Muslims in the United States. And people just don't think of that. You hear the term Muslim, you don't think Southeast Asians and Indonesians and Malays. You just, that's not the image that the popular media conjures up. Although that's where the largest concentration and the, the most populous Muslim country on earth is Indonesia. By contrast, it's over-inclusive, as the Sikh community knows. There was a shooting just uh, yeah, you know, yeah, a month yeah. ago, or, or a month and a half ago, of, of, of literally a, a Sikh temple being attacked by an ignorant anti-Muslim kind of hater who thinks that he's killing Muslims. Why? Because they, uh, the term has become over-inclusive because they're associating the image of a turban and a beard with Islam. So the terminology itself is problematic. The way it unfolds in political reality is problematic. And then the fact that there's so much social kind of ignorance perpetuated and, and constantly bombarded with visual media it adds to the problem. But, you know, on this quest of Islam, many of the recent confrontations over free speech has been with respect to Islam. I mean, um, it's not primarily, it's not um, solely with respect to Islam, but many of the certainly um, high profile ones. So where, I mean, and for some it's because of the particular nature of Islam, um, whether religiously or, 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 or politically. For, uh, uh, but others um, don't, want to, w w don't think that uh, it's problematic to view Islam in itself as a problem. It, w how do you see it? Is, is, is there something special about Islam that makes it problematic? Or is it part and parcel of a kind of wider um, approach to questions of religion and free speech? How much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, this is a huge topic, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the brief Cliff Notes version of, of the answer that, you know, this is something that I wrestle with constantly and is very much an unfolding, you know, exploration. But uh, certainly I could tell you that a couple of, for me, truths that I've, I've arrived at is the fact that, you know, on the one hand, I think it's, it's probably all of those different inputs. In other words, there is a problem with the fact that Islam uh, you know, as a, a religious force on the earth today is still a, a, a teaching that is radically challenging modernism as a philosophical school. Modernism being, you know, not, moder not to be confused with mo modernity, but modernism, the philosophical school that is predicated on the notion that existence is not meaningless, that, that existence is not meaningful. Physical existence, material existence is meaningless. And there's a divorcing of the profane from the profound. So even if you believe that there is a God or there's a higher power, you don't really think that it has anything to do with life here on earth. And you might say simultaneously, well, I believe in God, but I don't have to live my life according to any rules or any moral accountability. That notion is one that has gained quite a bit of currency in the modern age, and Islam vehemently argues against that. The Quran is basically a text that makes a series of logical, persuasive, spiritual arguments precisely attacking that premise, that no, their existence is meaningful, not meaningless, and nihilism is a wrong conclusion when it comes to understanding the true nature of created reality. So I think that that tension is there, and that's gonna be there, because a lot of other religions have just basically capitulated with this dominant narrative. Um, on, the, on the flip side, there is something to be said for the fact that Muslims and Islam are being framed as the problem by the visual medium of our age, by the, those who are kind of, you know, the, the architects of that. And there's, there's a reason for that as well. So it's a complicated mess. And I think that in the end of the day, the only way out for me personally is to recognize that, all, you know, take a spiritual view of, of actually what's happening. And these things have been literally the case throughout all of human history. Every religious tradition, every wisdom tradition has confronted and faced this type of uh, problem squaring the circle, Islam happens to be the youngest of the great world religions. But, but the, the, the issue I suppose you raised towards the end is how to deal with the question of confrontations with Islam at a time when there's also growing hostility towards Muslims. Um, uh, there's, 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 uh, a lot of people um, argue, for instance, that um, precisely because there is growing hostility towards Muslims, that we should not confront Islam over questions of free speech because that plays in, in, into that hostility. I mean, wh where do you stand on, 
on, on, on, those, on that issue. Svetlana? <laughs> That's complicated. Well, I think for one, it's um, very clear that religion cannot be separated from the geopolitical circumstances of its existence. And it, it just, you know, to remind people that Christianity has not always been peaceful, you know, we can think of the Inquisition, we can think of iconoclasms, we can think of the Crusades. So uh, in, a, in a different historical um, period, uh, religions are differently positioned, and we have a time when there's a huge Muslim immigration to, to Europe, the kind of the, the return of the, the colonies, um, and related to that, uh, an economic, uh, there's also an economic crisis and a lot of xenophobia, a lot of... So they're, they're very complex geopolitical circumstances that uh, frame the existence uh, of this religion right now. Uh, but when the question comes, okay, well, we have these volatile masses, and should we then be more careful as to how we speak? And that, this is the facts on the ground. This is what has been happening. You know, Yale University Press published a book about the... Danish cartoon crisis a few years ago, and it removed every image from inside the book, every image not only of the cartoons, every image of Muhammad. There were illustrations from Dante's Inferno, where Muhammad appears in one of the circles of hell, uh, and these illustrations was al were also removed from the book. Uh, so there was this increasing wave of self-censorship to prevent violence, and what Yale University Press claimed is, well, this book might possibly cause violence somewhere, uh, and, and they removed it. So um, that, that is a, what we'd call a slippery slope. Where do you stop? And then... Um, but isn't, it, that, like, isn't that itself the problem? That, that, that is, that the very perception that Muslims are so sensitive that, that the moment you, you, you do something like that, they will all riot. It's, doesn't that itself feed into the hostility uh, towards Muslims. And if you actually want to challenge that hostility towards Muslims, what you also need to do is challenge this idea that Muslims are so sensitive and, and to challenge uh, the, the restrictions on free speech. It seems to me that, that you know, people who argue that in order to challenge hostility to, uh, towards Muslims, you need, to greater free, uh, you need greater restrictions on free speech, have it back to front. And what they're doing is actually feeding hostility mm. towards Muslims. It does. <laughs> and that's true, you know, it, it, it's, it kind of takes us to that broad, broader issues we were talking about before, which is the question of dealing with free speech in a plural society, and this argument that um, in a plural society you need greater restrictions on free speech. Well, I mean, I think that uh, free speech advocates have long held, uh, and I, I certainly consider myself one of them, that, uh, you know, when, when there, whenever you open up the space for freedom of expression. People will say things that, that some people don't like. That's the nature of, of expression. And uh, when, when Group Leader was mentioning this guy who came up to you and said, well, you know, I respect your, your, your play, you being a playwright and an artist, why did you have to put it in, 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 this, in the temple? And, and your response was, well, that's you know, just as passionate as you feel about opposing this is how passionate I feel about, about saying it. You know, that's a beautiful exchange to me because the reality is, the moment we allow, we want people to speak, and they're gonna share their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions and their sensations and their realities, necessarily some people will not like what some people say. And then the problem emerges, well, is the, pro is the solution to that, let's call it bad speech, is the solution to a bad speech less speech or more speech? And I think the answer is pretty clear. Free speech advocates have, have kind of worked it out and figured out that trying to, Trying to call for less speech, you know, shouting people down, banning books, burning books, etc., is not only foolish and, and counterproductive. The simple reality is exactly what what Gripley was saying: if you don't like, you know, my play set in a temple, write your own play. You know, if you don't like a book, publish your own book, publish your refutation, to do something constructive. I think that it comes down to understanding that being constructive and being destructive are two fundamentally different trajectories. And those who just want to shout and scream and burn and protest are often channeling very destructive energies. And it's always easier to destroy something than it is to build something. Sure. Uh, it also seems to me that, um, in a sense, the argument against giving offense is an argument against any kind of social change. Because any kind of social change is going to offend some group. And the, the idea that that's offensive 
it's usually used by the most conservative groups to say, we don't want change in our community. We, we want to run our, commu our community the way we want. We don't want any change. Uh, and and this goes back to the question of hostility towards Muslims, that um, to, ch to create change, you have to offend some group or other. Capri? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think, you know, being offended, feeling offended, feeling a bit upset about something is kind of part of life, you know? And I do think also it's not so much religion, but fundamentalist within religions, whether it's Christianity, as I think the Christian fundamentalists are also kind of, you know, have their issues with um, what you can say and what you can't say. And I think it's just trying to continue, uh, you know, as artists to be true to that impulse. But it's also very important for the institutions to support artists. It's very hard to keep doing it on your own. And for our, you know, politicians and, you know, arts funding bodies to be brave, you know? And it's hard to be brave because it's a bit scary because some of these people can be really scary. But you have to do it because otherwise, You've sort of lost the battle before you've started. Maybe it needs us to be more scary than them. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, well, thank you all very much. Um, unfortunately, we've um, run out of time. So it's the kind of discussion we could have all day. We probably will have all day. <laughs> but thank you very can much. Can I get 30 second closing? I, okay. You can get um, your last I, I just want to say two real quick things. Uh, one is, uh, you know, this is a beautiful quote that I live my life by. Art, uh, sorry, politics demonizes, art humanizes. Uh, and that's why I consider myself an artist. And I would like to say, in case I offended anyone here today, I just want you to know you're too sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.